was just reminded uh, last year when a young man named Mario Dean in Jamaica was picked up by the police for a spliff, talked back to the police officer, found himself in a jail cell, and was beaten to death by somebody. Uh, and I'm proud that DPA arranged, if I recall correctly, for the same coroner who went down to investigate what happened to Michael Brown and Ferguson to go down to Jamaica and see what happened there. And his sacrifice helped move things in Jamaica. The next speaker is a medical anthropologist and indigenous people's activist, Juliana Willers. Juliana. Hi there, I'm going to open this with an indigenous greeting from a Mayan language. I'm happy in my heart to see you, my drug reform family. I've been going to this conference for, this is my second conference here. I came here in 2013, but I have been involved in drug reform for quite a while. I used to live on the West Coast where I began in harm reduction uh, intervention. I was trained by MAPS at Burning Man in 2005, and since then I've been doing workshops at festivals to teach people safe tripping, so that can kind of mitigate all the work I have to do on the back end when they don't trip safely. So um, I am presently in school, and I am a volunteer with Operation ID, where we do forensic analysis on the remains of migrants who die trying to cross the border. So I literally handle the skeletons of people who are trying to make it to the US because they're fleeing cartel violence. I am also a human rights observer with several detention centers in Texas where several women are being housed right now while they're being evaluated to see whether or not they are worthy of refugee status here in the US. And I can tell you that it, unequivocally, most of them are deported and Obama has supported more refugees from Central America than any president before him. I'm also here in the capacity of an indigenous activist because I've been in this movement since about 2004 actually, and during that time, I have been waiting for indigenous voices to be part of this dialogue. That has not really been happening, and I've actually had to take the opportunity at times to call attention to that. I am indigenous. I am Comanche on my mother's side. On my father's side, I am Chiricahua, Apache, and I am also Mayan. So the only way that I can actually reconcile the privilege I have as an indigenous person relative to what I do have is that I work for my people and the uplifting of them. And I do have to say that I was a little bit, or more than a little bit, dismayed that the few panels that were dedicated to indigenous people did not really include many indigenous voices, only one. And that person was actually from South America. There was no representation for North American people on our homeland in discussions about indigenous rights and culture and the use of psychotic, psychoactive substances that we have given to the world. So, So there's a couple things that I want to kind of, you know, say since we're all friends here. If you've ever had the chance to use peyote, raise your hand. Let's be honest, because I won't tell on you. <laughs> I just want to let you know that I'm the first person in at least four generations in my family to be able to use peyote. Nobody else in my family on my mother or my father's side, and they're both from peyote-using tribes, has had access to this sacrament. I have a lot of family who is struggling with addiction and all the other effects of colonization. And I was really disheartened to see two panels devoted to acid forfeiture and none on the epidemic of native addiction and suicide on the reservations in Canada and here in the US. I do want to say that I was really, really happy to see the Black Lives Matter activists here. You all are so important to what's going on. And we do live in a very special time right now where we can actually start to heal some of those wounds caused by enslavement of people and genocide. And there's a couple things that were said by a few of those women on the panel that I wanted to actually bring to your attention. And I think it was Deborah Smalls who said, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read without my glasses. Uh, sorry. 
sorry. Okay, I gotta break them out, sorry. I am kind of getting blind as a bat here, okay. Deborah knows what she said, but she said, drug policy reform provides theory and practice to dismantle racism. Erasure is racism, and I'm really hoping that in the next conferences that we have, we can move forward to include indigenous voices because my people are dying on the res, and they're dying at the border. We're about to convene a UN special assembly on drugs, and Latin America is not being represented adequately here. Latin America is suffering disproportionately because of American consumption. I had the opportunity last night to meet and mourn with a mother who lost four sons in the drug war in Mexico. Meeting her and seeing what she and her family are going through is the only thing that gets me out of bed and the only thing that helps me to be able to do the work I do, to be in the lab and working on the bodies of these peoples whose family have no idea what happened to them and not knowing is one of the worst things that you can actually go through. We're not on the radar yet, and I really need for you all to do a little bit more to center indigenous voices. I don't think it's lack of concern, I just think it's lack of being informed. I hope that's what's going on. Native people have always shared what they had, even in the face of colonization, even in the face of genocide, and we will continue to share. If you wanna actually learn about these medicines, that we have relationships that span millennia, you need to learn about us. It's time for anthropologists and drug reformers to stop talking about indigenous people and start talking with indigenous people. Thank you for listening.